Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I'm Tom, and tonight I am joined by the legendary Marvel writer, legendary writer in all aspects, Mr. D.G. Chichester. How are you tonight, my friend? I'm good, Tom. This is a cool one. This is a flashback uh, episode in a lot of ways, although also modern because the show we're going to talk about while well, it came out in the 70s, right? That is true. Um, uh, I, I never watched it until you sort of brought it back to my attention. I would kept hearing about it, but had never actually sat down to actually see it. So it's got, it's got both ends of the spectrum. And it's, it's the funny thing with me too, is that I've always heard of this said project, but I never, it was really only until you were like, let's, let's kind of do something with this. And I was yeah. like, yeah, all right. I've never watched it. The project we were referring to is the 1973 made for television, uh, made for television film, by NBC Studios that was released February 21st, 1973. We are talking about the Norlis tapes, which tells the story of David Norlis, played by Roy Thines? Thines. 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 I think it's, I, I think it's Thines, but I'm I want to say sure. Thines. So if, if, yeah. if I'm wrong, correct me on it later, somebody. But uh, and, well, and a well known uh, actor in that time, you know, really, uh, he was in a lot of productions. He was a very famous television star, most notably yes. from the late 60s television show The Invaders, which was a story about That's alien exact, invaders. Yeah, classic, <laughs> classic, classic television series. So do friend, we need to explain to the to the readers what a tape is? Uh, readers, watchers, listeners, you know. <laughs> I, I went scouring for a tape. Yeah, you know, when you had said that, I went scouring for a tape because I knew I had one something. I think it was at my mother's house, and I wasn't about right. to go bug mom and look for a cassette tape because she'd look exactly. at me. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's comical how technology that seems so you know, just like an imprint on everything, you know, cassette tapes were how you recorded stuff, right? Mass medium ability to record and, and pop those little things in. They seem like magical and they clunk in and, and this little, whatever it was, Mylar tape, you know, would allow you to record on it. But now for, it's for just, almost an hour and a half, David Norris. Yeah, for tape. almost an hour and a half. Amazing. You know, and, Did, uh, so but, the Norlis tape was a production of Dan Curtis, and Dan Curtis was a legendary. Well, I wouldn't say legendary at this. Yeah, point. I would. No, I'd go with it. I would You'd go yeah. legendary because he created. Well, by the time movie. he finished his career, you know, and he moved into all the things we might touch on here, but I mean, he did many, many productions. I mean, including big, uh, the Winds of War. You know, big productions on. Uh, I mean, probably not well known now, but by the time he he uh, you know moved out of. Uh, probably active working in Hollywood. I think he had made a significant contribution to television production, especially. Well, Norlis tapes came between, I think, Night Stalker and, no, it was after Night Strangler. But he had this niche that after Dark Shadows, he kind of didn't want to direct, I think. That was the vibe I got. And unless it was a good little script that he helped develop with Richard Matheson, who I love Richard Matheson. I was going to ask you, do you, are, were you familiar with Richard Matheson at that time? Oh yeah. I mean, oh Matheson, yeah. See, I, I don't even know why I, I asked that question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Matheson as, as an author, um, you know, uh, listeners and watchers, you know, would, would probably recognize, uh, you know, his contribution most significantly in terms of like I am legend, which is the classic, uh, you know, vampire, you know, story, the Great re book. reverse vampire story book, made into several different movies but he was uh he was an anchor in the original twilight zone you know writing many, many 20,000 uh, feet 20, si feet. significant significant episodes um and as an author in f fantasy often dark fantasy borderline science fiction you know always had a great uh uh way with plot and characterization and and dialogue that really made it feel very uh, pulp and real so uh, i think his his impact on Night Stalker and Night Strangler, especially with with Curtis, uh, you know, was probably bringing that wryness, you know, and that dialogue and characterization, uh, which is somewhat lacking in in Norlis tapes. When when you and I yes. first started talking about this, I sort of said, "Oh, it's kind of like the proto uh, Night Stalker," because uh, for folks who don't know either of these productions. Uh, the Norlis tapes is around an author named Norlis, and we come into the story kind of his editor, right, or his manager. It or his was interesting or because like it's, it's it was interesting for me because the way the picture starts is he's already at rock bottom. He's 
Right. And then he goes missing, right? Yes. And it's just sort of out of the blue and his publisher and the lawyer, they don't know where he is. And then he's living right. in this lavish mansion in San Francisco by the bay. Right. This glass house, if you will, which I actually thought was kind of interesting coming from a writer. Right, right, right. And then they, they discover... figure out he's gone. And with no explanation, they put in the tape and they tell the story via the whole flashback. Right. He's, he, they find his uh, his notes on tape or his recollections of this uh, supernatural story he's investigating. And then, uh, but the Night Stalker, uh, both the movies and then later the TV series, uh, the device there is that the reporter, Carl Kolschak, very often leaves his observations on tape in real time as notes to himself and therefore embellishes the story for the viewer. Although his observations are, to my, my mind, a lot more credible dry and well credible yeah but i mean they're they're just fun you know his yeah. narration is a lot punchier than norlis who is relatively oddly flat like there was he's one very scene where... flat and it's funny because yeah. like, i really wanted to like the norlis character almost by comparison to kolchek i was like okay this is going to be the b right. minus kolchek right but he and starts I, I... off too very very um skeptical Right, yes. he starts at the beginning. Sort of right, the character, the writer is known for debunking, debunking supernatural. The supernatural. Right, yeah, it, it, it's then, he's not like a Fox Mulder. Although I did get a little bit of a Fox Mulder vibe from him in yeah. certain scenes, which was strange. But I was like, this kind of, you know. But he was the way Norlis. Go ahead. No, I was going to say because he's a bit of a stiff. I mean, he's you know, a stiff. To, to to me, it's odd that the whole thing takes place in San Francisco in the seventies, and it is the most ungroovy production <laughs> yeah. how, many, I can exactly, imagine. how many productions took place at that time that like dirty harry and bullet you know and i don't know if magnum force had come out yet at the time but like they show san francisco like a character in the right in the movie you know but right. this was just sort of the the house on the bay and then yeah they, and they there's go nothing upstate. about it except maybe a little you get a little bit of a of a groovy vibe from the um Close. And I can't remember the character's name. Uh, who's the who, who's the psychic uh, uh, it was woman? Jack L or something like that. Yeah, she's sort of like a you know she's running like a crystal supernatural artifact store, right? And, yes. And uh, and then and then she has a little bit of a of a counterculture vibe to her, but not much. No, but 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 Norlis was a very dry person, and I, I was reading something that compared him to Kolchak. And I know we compare mm -hmm. them a lot because Dan Curtis sort of does the same stuff, you know, at that time in the early to mid seventies, you know, the narration, the, the dryness. Well, that's of why the... I, that's why I thought it was like a proto Kolchak wrongly, you know, but I thought like, okay, they tried out the motif here. It was a little flat. They juiced it up then with, with Kolchak, but instead yeah. it goes the other direction. Exactly. Start, which is weird. <laughs> yeah. Very weird. Cause there's scenes where he's just, uh, like his narration is is beyond see and say. You know, he's like driving along the the. the he's driving along the beautiful it's raining. bridge. Yeah, but he's like saying, you know, it's it was a rainy, cold day. You know, going over the bridge to San Francisco while you're seeing the rain and the cold. Yeah, and the car driving over the bridge. It's it was sort of almost like this into a commentary, almost. But 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 a commentary you can see. It was almost the the, you know the the vi visually challenged, you know, audio track or something. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> funny. It weird. In your film guy too, and you probably picked, I I'm assuming you picked up on this and I don't want to assume, but I, I kind of figured you'd pick up on this. All the pictures you may have seen of Norlis, like on online, when you were watching it, things like that, when he's got the, that big microphone, you know? Right. Right. Not right. once do you see him do that in the film. No, oh. that seems like a completely uh production. Um, you know, still or something like that, you know, maybe because yeah, he never really, oh, there's a couple times where you see him kind of record into a cassette uh, recorder, I guess, you know, where, where he's doing that, but nothing with the microphone as he goes along, as he's investigating this, this, right. It's a death of a, of a sort of a, a rich woman's, um, a rich artist, I guess. Right. He's, he's yeah, a, rich so it was a rich artist. It was a rich artist. Uh, and, he meets the widow, played lo by the lovely Angie Dickinson, who was like in another every... staple, yeah, of the 70s. staple of that yeah. of that era, and she was like in everything. Mm -hmm. But I did like the interactions between the widow and and 
in Norlis a little bit because Norlis this was such a skeptic and dry, but it was like so dry that it was like you can't like what is gonna crack this guy? And I just wanted like to see him almost relax and like be him. I'm assuming that would have happened in a in a television series as it progressed. You would have seen more character. Maybe. I mean, it's it's uh you know there were enjoyable things about it. We're kind of like you know we're picking at the scabs of the show, but I mean I think I think we both enjoyed it and it definitely has a, a you know has a quality of of uh, uh, it achieves something i think for the time if you go back and read some of the reviews of the of it some like it, it felt like it was yeah the, the, a lot of people liked it you know it kind of had a breakthrough sense of modernizing the revenant or zombie or vampirish uh character whatever the monster ultimately was it wasn't a hundred percent defined no, it, to me, it seemed like it was it was um, a zombie with a vampire. It, you know, it was a ghoul. It was like the it, it was a ghoul. Head. No, that, I think that's actually the best thing. Yeah, it was because it was collecting blood to uh, of its victims to then use in a, a a statue, a clay statue it was building that was then going to be resur. Uh, uh, transformed the god of sargoth i believe in, 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 yeah some kind of some kind of de demonic uh thing but uh but it was like mixing and matching stuff right because the 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 ring that that gave the ghoul the power to come back to life was odd wasn't it like the ring of osiris so it kind of the had ring like of a, osiris because like an egyptian flair yes so it had but, this, yeah it had this egyptian flair like you said right. with this but 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 the, but the psychic woman was very Creole. I thought she came across very New Orleans Creole. And then when you finally see the demon, uh, it almost looks like Lou Ferrigno. I wanted to. I want to emphasize. Yeah, I saw when your I picture. Watched that, I'm like, when the hell did Red Hulk show up in the seventies? <laughs> right, but but he's he's like he's a he's a red demon ish thing with a cape. So he's very classic uh, monster. You know, demon 101 yeah and and you know he's not even like an egyptian demon you know he doesn't have uh qualities there's a lot of mixed things going on there it was um, a, but it was a lot of ingredients in that blender yeah exactly you know? it, 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 i did get a sense of identity not crisis but like what what do, what do we want to be maybe or just maybe it was the kind of the mix and match of the that's why i sort of you know think it's it's so easy to to kind of dissect things from, well, God, 50 years later, um, uh, y you know, versus being in the moment. Like in the moment did that, here we can sort of say, what are they doing? Why aren't they drawing a straight line between those those? But we weren't, in, we weren't in California in 1973 when they were. Exactly. Yeah. And also like the mishmash of, of demonic pop culture influence, right, between the omen and the exorcist and and you know ride with the devil and it does another rosemary's things. baby rosemary's baby right everything you know felt like a kind of a demon stew so it may have just fit that whole um vibe in in a in an okay way it's like yeah you know demon stuff just throw it in there there was that one line where he you know he throws out something and i kind of laughed out loud and it was just uh you know uh an alchemical circle of blood set on fire will contain the demon. Will contain just, the demon in the circle, and I'm just like, where, where did all that come from? It didn't even it didn't even look through like a a, a you know. He says it like kind of you know preparing it. He goes according to Mesopotamian lore, and I'm like, when exactly. Was <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I guess that's what he was researching in the the library or the research center or something. But you know, you needed to kind of see him in the. Uh, Egyptian you needed to uh, see section. him with the big uh book kind of right the book with the cartouche on the front of it or something <laughs> like that to to kind of get to it but um do, do you remember hearing of this film at all back in the in the day or is this something kind of rediscovered anew now for it, you you know, you know it's one of those things I did hear about and certainly I was a fan of Curtis especially for um you know for for Kolchak and the Night Stalker stuff which I which I loved and and feel you know was a was a iconic kind of presence in in my own pop culture and my own storytelling. I would agree um, with me. So it, it holds a near and dear spot with me. Yeah. So so I definitely heard of it, and and I would just a couple of years ago. I, I'm pretty sure it was my friend Carl Waller, um, is an artist, great artist. Uh, 
had mentioned it kind of in the same way you did, you know, he, cause we were talking, I think about horror films and Kolchak and he sort of said, did you ever see that, that, uh, uh, Norless tapes? And I was like, no, I, I never did. And he was a fan of it. And I think turned me on to the fact that it was available on YouTube, oddly enough. So, um, you know, when you brought it up, uh, it, it just seemed like a, well, this is a perfect thing to finally kind of, kind of watch it, you know, and see what the hell it is. So yeah. I'm glad it's still drifting out there on YouTube because uh, I can't imagine where else you'd find this thing. The DVD is massively out of print because Lord knows I went looking. I will confess that right. to those guys. And I, I'm like, I am not spending $47 on, on no, an out of print no. DVD from 1970, uh, from a movie 1973. No. Well, it's like that book I mentioned. There's there's a book um, by a guy named Jeff Thompson uh, called The Television Horrors of Dan Curtis that there was a small excerpt on um, Google Books uh, and it sort of touched on some of the Night Stalker stuff and I think it touched a little bit on the Norlis tapes uh, in the section that they made available, which seemed like it was really well-researched and really interesting about facts around the production and Curtis's thinking and, and so forth, but... To get the book, it was something like fifty dollars. I saw it I, after you message after you had messaged me that I went and saw it on. Yeah, uh, so I went to thrift uh, books. I knew I went to all these little secondary. With the things same journey I did, right? Yeah. It's like, well, that'd be cool, but I'm not that. I'm not that in right love now. with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe in time, if I need something else, but I have, you know, umpteen books here that have never been read. So we got to waste about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a comment Richie Dickey do says, Hey guys. <laughs> hey Richie. Hey Richie. What's up? <laughs> um, um, with the Norlis tapes though, it's, it's almost like shot. I was a little shocked to see no series came from it because of the Curtis's clout with dark shadows mm. and cold check getting ready to take off. But that was a different scenario, but it just, it seems strong enough for me to see more, but I think the mistake they made Spoiler alert, was ending on a cliffhanger. But even the cliffhanger sort of feels, and again, different dynamics, right? A, a cliffhanger today would end, ends in a much different way, maybe. Yeah, but maybe cliffhangers not. in the cliffhanger, 40s cliffhanger. with an action beat with a, with a hero falling off a cliff. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, cliffhangers, that's where the, where, the, uh, you know, where the term comes from. So it's not like we can say, oh, the 70s didn't have enough drama and their definition of cliffhanger yeah they didn't it, have enough serial by nature right it's uh, just for and spoiler alert for for folks you know um it ends with the end of this kind of ghoul adventure and then uh his editor or publisher or whoever the guy is uh uh goes to norlis's house and finds another set of tapes yes and then puts them in to the tape player and then you you maybe you hear the first couple of lines of what would presumably be the second adventure or but exploration. If you, listen to the, if you listen to the dialogue closely, he was actually describing that morning. Oh, was he? Okay, I didn't. Yes. I, didn't I didn't listen. But so closer in, but I just didn't feel it was. It, it it's so soft as a cliffhanger. Yes, even in terms of setting up the next adventure. Okay, uh, there is a there's just a soft quality. The credits are coming up. The camera yeah. pulls back from that glass house, and it's sort of there's a drifty, you know, soft fade quality to it. Uh, it. It didn't have the impact, I think, even for viewers to say, "Well, we want some more of this, right?" Yeah. We want. And, they and weren't rushing. For, they weren't clamoring for a part two, right? And there was a lot of those. I think. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of TV movies from that time that seem to kind of get churned through. Um, you sounds like you did a little bit more research. Was this part of? Uh, I know NBC had sort of that uh, thematic mystery movie of the, of the week. week. Yeah, was it yeah. part of that cycle? Yeah. So yeah. that they seem to churn through a lot of those things and maybe arbitrarily made a a decision which would go to pilot, which would go to. But you know those seventies. I've always been a sucker for those 70s TV movies, whether, you know, they became a series or not. But, like, it's weird because I've only, I only dipped my toe into Kolchek more than I never saw Norlis tapes till last week. The Great mm -hmm. Ice Robbery or whatever it was, Curse of the Black Widow, you know, some of them I just never, I just, like, I dipped my toe in. Now I feel like, 
okay, okay, mom, I gotta, I gotta dive in, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, some of the stuff, uh, like anything, you know, can become a, a rabbit hole and you, sometimes you find some gems, you know, sometimes you find some things. There was one, um, geez, what the hell is it called? There was one Gene Roddenberry sort of demon ish production. Um, I wish I could remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, and it, it had a kind of, a you know, X Spectre. It was called Spectre. Spectre. Um, yeah. and it was, uh, it was a couple of, investigators in a very x-files way if i remember one was a true believer one was a skeptic right investigating uh, uh demonology i can't remember if specter was like the name of an organization or something like that but whatever it, it actually had a to my mind it had a pretty good uh vibe they had good personality they had good character dynamics if i went back and watched it now I don't know. Would it, yeah, it's would one it of the, hold like, up at all, or would it be, feel like it's Land of the Lost or something? <laughs> interesting comment now from the lovely Chelsea Langelier. There is no presumed closure to his character. She is referring to Norlis. For me, it ended with a big question mark where I was like, wait, there's no more. Yeah. I, that, I, it I happens. Think, I think that's spot on. It's It really just kind of, you know, settles. And there's not even a, you know, one of the problems with Kolchak uh as it moved into a series was you had this eminently um obviously smart guy right kolchak carl kolchak as a reporter was was smart streetwise and yet we began each monster of the week episode then subsequently with him always back to doubting that there's the supernatural yes right? but we clearly have seen him many times confront the supernatural so that sort of never added up after time um, which is probably one of the things that undermined it as it, an ongoing show. It probably but, it went to its de led to its demise too, among other right. things, which maybe one day we can attest, to, we can get to. <laughs> but Norlis, we don't see the turn either, right? We don't see we we begin with a sort of an offhanded reference at the beginning that he's famous for um, supernatural as a, as an author, again debunking the supernatural, right? That's yeah. kind of known as like I'm the guy who comes in and takes down Yuri Geller and and you know shows that the the there's a string attached to the the Ouija board you know plachette or, or that whatever um and there needed to be a scene to my mind to really get to what Chelsea was sort of saying about where's this character going where he has that big turn of confront it with the supernatural and then digging in deeper Right. Yeah. And then sort of saying, I'm against all of my experience and against all of my predilections or, or prejudices. I have to now embrace this. There's a little bit of it, but it needs more of that for a kind of an arc. And then importantly, to want to see more. That was the thing. I felt like Norlis never had that arc. Like you said, there should have yeah. been a moment where he like at a come to Jesus moment, kind of just like, I'm wrong. Like, this is real. I'm wrong or yeah there's more to this or uh um uh something I don't know I mean it had we're picking again like you know has a lot we're of really problems. picking at we're picking but, but, at. but you know that's the thing it's like it's not it's it's just an interesting it's an interesting artifact kind of movie you know there's good it's not terrible but it's not it's not great but it sort of represents probably as I think you said earlier kind of a collection of different influences and 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 did curtis have a contract and he had to churn out a movie before he got onto the next thing uh, you know, i don't know <laughs> you know that kind of thing i think I, I think you're frozen i don't know if you can still hear me well, i see the clock ticking All right, maybe I should jump out and come back in. No, I think I lost you.
Out of all the times for my Wi-Fi to crap out. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's those moments where you're babbling on and like you say, man, Tom is really focusing on this comment. You know, he seems to really be into it. And then you realize like, no, nope. it's just a frozen face. So <laughs> wasn't that I uh, humbly applaud. <laughs> no worries. It's technology. Beauty, the beauty of technology. No, I apologize. But uh, if I could trouble you into kind of repeating what you just said, just a smidge. Um, geez, where, what were we on? Um, it was probably something. Uh, I can't remember what we were saying. Um, obviously about Norlis. And uh, I think I was just saying that, uh, you know, while we're picking at it, it's, it's, uh, you don't know all the things that kind of go into it. You know, the, the assembly of things that happen at that time, uh, the influences, did Curtis just have a, a contract to have to make a movie, you know, so maybe he just had to get something done for that movie of the week model. Um, and so in that, in that time, this seemed like breakthrough taking, taking the classic ghoul story, putting it in a modern day, throwing in Angie Dickinson, um, throwing in Ray, uh, Roy Thines, you know, that sort of thing. Does it add up to then, a a, a, a executive producer saying, yeah, those are a lot of known elements and dependable elements and also some, you know, off, uh, uh, you know, off angled, uh, approaches to things, and plus demons are big now. Go for it. <laughs> demons were big in 1973. Demons were huge in the 70s. They're not enormous. I mean, you know, the satanic panic was, was you know, huge. The, uh, uh, you know, some of the biggest pop culture properties uh, undermining the fabric of society, you know, were, were demon-oriented, right? Satan-oriented. You know, we, we had touched upon Norlis's narration and things like that, but those were prevalent in a lot of... Uh curtis productions and that's mm. actually how i first heard of the norlis tapes was on a bonus featurette of the night stalker the interview that i had sent oh, you oh really oh okay. that is the first time i ever heard of the norlis oh, that's tape. where it's from it's it's i didn't realize when you sent me that that's from um that's off a, a night stalker that is off the night tape. stalker dvd that was released by, i think you know the mid 2000s and okay. when i bought it and i bought you know I'm a, I'm a special features guy and i want to know what what's going on creatively that it was how I just I heard the Norlis tapes. So it okay. It only it only came back this year when we were when I brought it up to you when you were right. You know, okay, that's how it okay. all connected. And he mentions how narration and it's kind of true. I think with comic books too. You know your your area of expertise. You know your with Daredevil and Nick Fury and so on and so forth. But narration you can get away with showing a lot, telling a lot of stuff without showing it. Well, you can, but I don't think that that's that was the weird thing about Norlis, um, to me again, that they don't they don't add an additional layer in most places. Yes, you know, it's 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 so it's so see and say that the danger of narration is the power of narration in this type of production um, in a comic, you know, where it's the the internal monologue of the character or the the third party voice of the author or, or whatever is maybe something's going on the page and you've got a chance to do something that is um associated but adds another layer to it uh the danger is you can go too far off right you can start talking about something that's so disconnected from what's going on the screen or on the page that you either you possibly lose the viewer or the reader right and you can have too much character almost like does exactly. the reader yeah you're going, you're going in like you, you're, you're trying to add in so much other stuff that it's, it's, it's just disconnecting and losing the visceral appeal of the art on the page, especially in comics. Um, but, but I, but you know, visually on the screen as well, or you can just be so damn boring, uh, <laughs> that you're, you're just, you're just hitting the notes, the C insaneness of it, right? It's there already. So what are you saying? That's, 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 uh, that's not why does the viewer need to know i'm going over the bridge with the trees and the rocks crushing causing a whiteness and things like that yeah we is, see you know, it in the scene exactly you know that would have been a perfect place for him to do more of that you know the the uh, even observation around you know my entire career you, you know fog meant nothing to me except uh fog it's a scientific principle or whatever for the first time going over this bridge 
you know, fog to me is mystery. Fog to me is I don't know what's on the other side. I travel you know, into the uncertainty, not knowing whether I be what I believed is false to be true and things of that sort. See, there you go. Like we can we can overdub it. Would that be the a special episode where you just overdub the Norlis tapes? So we will redo the, the Norlis tapes. That exactly. was actually something. I went out for lunch today, and then I was like talking about Norlis tapes with with Chelsea, and which is the sign of something that I actually liked when I keep talking about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I I was like, I'm gonna ask DG what he would do if he could do a part two. So I pose that question to you, sir. If you, if someone said to you, I've acquired the rights to Norlis tapes, I want to bring it back. <laughs> but with a 70s I think, I think I could probably, probably buy it for like, you know, you know, $8 and 95 cents. Um, for the, the yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would turn the, the dial up on the seventies. I would, you know, I would really embrace that aesthetic a, a lot more than I even feel that they did there. I mean, it doesn't even feel it didn't it felt like a timeless 70s yeah exactly i would i would really kind of dial into a uh you know it's like a quentin tarantino vibe of that time period really play it up and enjoy it right because there's a lot to enjoy about the the 70s in terms of fashion and language and if we kept it in san francisco again i would i would embrace the counterculture um edit i think it would probably to, to correct for some of the sins of the 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 first one have this author almost begin with a with a re um a redoubling down on his on his on his doubt right you, you know my success has been built on uh, doubt uh, doubt right you know dr driving doubt writing about doubt uh clearing the way debunking things where did I let myself go with this ghoul? Maybe he's even in therapy. I don't know. That would be great, right? Have like a kind of like a a, a trippy uh, San Francisco therapist, like, you know, kind of like saying, you know, man, you fooled yourself. You know, you just like, you, you saw what you wanted to see. And, it's in and your mind, man. It's in your mind, man. Exactly. Um, as we play into our own, you know, hippie, trippy stereotypes. Uh, and then, um, and then have, uh, you, you know, the introduction of something um, that would take him into another uh, more overt adventure. Uh, it was an interesting touch, I think, with that, whatever the hell that demon was. You know, Sargoth. Suggest, Sargoth, right, whatever. Sargoth. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even look it up. Is there an, actually a Sargoth? Is there, no, is there I, I put Sargoth? it in the Zool category where I was like, I'll just take him at face value. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> 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 well, cool. well, uh, actually, you know, funny, you know, Sargoth is an Ephelim who betrayed his kind aligned with hell. Interesting. So uh, an Ephelim is a, is a, uh, offspring of a, of an angel and a, uh, and a human. So, okay. Um, so, uh, and I only know Worst that of because, of, <laughs> because of Richard Cadry's, uh, Sandman Slim books, which are, which I know you're reading right now. I, um, I have not started it yet. I'm currently okay. finishing actually a Patterson novel. The second that's done. Slam and Onto slam, that. but but the Sargoth thing felt kind of very old godish to me, you know, love Lovecraftian old god, even though a very limited one with his cape and his horns. But but maybe that would be the the shtick that that Norlis goes down the road on, you know, maybe instead of Kolchak's monster of the week jumping from zombies to vampires to werewolves uh, on in, cruise in, ships, werewolves on cruise ships to <laughs> um, uh, headless motorcycle gangs. Uh, you know, maybe Norlis would be involved in sort of unraveling these these old god stories. There's a great board game. Are you into board games at all, Tom? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, you ever play Mansions of Madness? You played no, one? no. It's a it's a big set game, so it's an investment. You know, you 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 know, it's a I think it's like fifty, sixty, seventy bucks, like one of these big monster games. But the way it's played, which is pretty cool is you get these different tiles of this mansion and as you play the game you you deal out the tiles so every game is a little bit different the layout of the mansion is different every time it's either the mansion or the town around it and then your characters have to move through um unraveling and then undoing some kind of lovecraftian um uh mystery at play and usually you get killed it's a pretty tough game um <laughs> But, you know, there was something a little bit to that with, uh, you know, him 
Norlis going into this rich artist's palatial home. It's up on the hill. It's away from other things. You know, that might have been a kind of an interesting motif to play out that he's his explorations don't take him hither and yon, but take him into these uh, uh, avenues, you know, to the to the rich and old money and such that may have uh, uh, connections, you know, to uh, to those old God sort of stories. That's that's like your your seven and a half minute, you know, answer. If, if answer, you, you, you answer put on the yeah put on the spot and you're going to give me the rights you know that's but, the that, if but, I yeah, give that, you the that'd rights be kind of fun to play with that would be fun to play with I like it seemed like that Norlis's world seemed like it could have been a lot more fun to play with absolutely I went into it thinking again Dan Curtis what I knew about him knowing it would be dated of course because it's from you know a different time period knowing their definition of action you know would be shots of stunt people being thrown into walls and and you know and the monster scenes being incredibly brightly lit and and stuff like that um but uh but i did expect a little bit more and i'll keep going back to this i just I just thought knowing it was a it was a writer in san francisco i expected it to be a lot groovier yeah. <laughs> you know it, it, it's funny because i i I liked it. I can't help but say I, I didn't. Too, I, yeah. it, I, I but it was, it. I, I would have, like you said, these little things that we could have seen differently. But again, we weren't in Curtis's moment or anything like that. Um, I've recommended it to a lot of people. Like I said, you got 70 minutes to kill. This is not a bad yeah. way to spend it. No, I mean, I think, I think, you know, for fans of, of horror and kind of historical, you know, things, um, you find you find pieces like this, and I'm not going to go back and rewatch it. Oh God, no! In my, in my in what's left of my lifetime, but but I'm glad I saw it. You know, I'm glad I, I finally caught up with it and got some. Okay, I could see pieces of that. I can see what it was influenced by. I can see even maybe where it, you know, it had some influence on things. It um, had a, it had great sets. I got to say that it had a lot of great locations. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The underground I mean, crypts and the and that the, was cool. That, yeah. that steedy motel, right? Yeah, the motel was weird. Very very. And the uh, monster, the ghouls makeup. Uh, just you know, I know the film was made. The film, the TV movie was made six years later, but it just screamed Salem's Lot. It does. Yeah, there's some screamed, there's some... and I sent the picture. I sent the picture to Dunzella, and he's like, "What are you watching, Salem's Lot?" And I was like. <laughs> Right. No, right. but <laughs> but 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 there's a, a a connection to that stuff. Yeah. So you know, it, it's it has that uh, it has that quality, and I think um, again, when you're a fan of that sort of genre and and horror, it's nice to kind of unpack certain things like that and get. Uh, uh, I went on a kind of a uh, did, I, did I mention this uh, documentary movie to you? Um, oh, geez, hang on. Uh, because we have real time um, research capabilities, Woodlands Dark Terrible. and Day Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched. You ever heard of this this film? I think you had mentioned it to me. So it's a three hour documentary on on uh, folk horror, and uh, and okay. so it's a it's a it's very entertaining. But it's very long, and and it just kind of um, unpacks the idea of folk horror. Uh, you know, basically like old world horror if you saw the witch you know the current movie the uh, in the mm -hmm. last few years that sort of thing of like there's old history and old evils in the woods and nearby and people either unleash it or get involved in it and it's more powerful the wicker man is a perfect example of folk horror um but the cool thing about this documentary aside from just being well done is it just mentions so many films English films, American films, films from around the world that are in this genre that I never heard of before. And I thought I was pretty well versed <laughs> in in horror films. And so my God, never heard of that one, never heard of that one, never saw that one. And it Are it, they all American really... or are they like put like Danish or English? Yeah, all over, all over. And I guess um Shudder, uh, which is uh you know, Leonardo DiCaprio service, movie? No, no, no. The, the, That's Shutter the, Island. The stream, the yeah, exactly. No, Shutter, the the streaming service that specializes in in horror films, uh, I guess, is now showing a lot of those uh, because of uh, because of this Woodlands Dark uh, movie. But but you know, sometimes that's a cool 
thing as opposed to watching something you've you've heard so much about you feel like you've already seen it or um or you've seen it already and you're just kind of like returning to it because it's, it's comfort food uh you, you know there's there's some something very cool about unpacking things that you you maybe have never seen i my a good friend of mine had never seen the original wicker man he thought that the only wicker man was the nicholas cage one so when i turned him on to the idea that there is one with christopher lee oh no oh yeah and and you know he was you know he's just like what how did i miss this but i like to acknowledge the original wicker man over the nicholas cage one oh well i mean I got my I I got uh, affection for Nick Cage in the right place, but it does not hold a candle to that, no. to the, the the strangeness and weirdness and evil of the original Wicker Man. What are some of the other things that you're watching now besides normal? Besides, did did you watch it in one sitting? Was it or no, was it like the Snyder not. Cut where it you was, had to come it, back multiple times? Not like that. The Snyder Cut was an exercise in uh, in. I, I don't know d diligence and feeling like I have to get through this. No, I, I wanted to watch the the Norlis, um, uh, you know, tapes, but it, it's low. You know, as you know, it's low quality on YouTube. Uh, oh, I found a good one. There was one where I found a very good quality of, and I was going to send it to you because I was like, oh god, he might oh, click I found this a pretty, one. I found a pretty low quality one, so it was it was muddy. Um, sound was okay, but the the picture was pretty muddy and. Uh, and so it was a little bit of a slog to watch. So I probably broke it up into, into probably three, you know, 20, yeah. 25 minute sections. Not because, and just because it was sort of, I was, the week I watched it, uh, I was, I was doing a lot of other projects and I just needed to kind of, it was my little break in between things. So the assembly of it was, was finally good, but. My, mine was in two sittings. I have to confess that the first 10 minutes of the first time I tried watching it, Maybe it was the time I tried watching or something. I just, I could not get into it like right mm -hmm. away. I just was like, give me something. I want to see something progress. And I, I was tired or whatnot. And then the second time it was basically come hell or high water. I will finish this. And then about yeah. 15 minutes in, I actually found myself liking it and it's, questioning it's... it and laughing about it and doing every, right. everything that. You... Right. <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's, 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 this is this is kind of in a way I, where I'd like to get that book, you know, at some point if I ever find it on on a bargain, you know, table, and if it gets into the production of this more, just because I'm curious, uh, knowing the rhythms of some of Curtis's other productions. Um, Were you a big Dark Shadows fan? No, I wasn't. I, I wasn't. I appreciated Dark Shadows. I I, um, I had a, a, a deep interest in a girl in high school who uh, <laughs> who was a big Dark Shadows fan. So I tried to kind of get into it, but I found the whole, um, I found the whole pacing of it and the soap opera like structure just, and, and a lot of it, if not all of it, you know, was shot on, on video. So it had a cheap, it look. had that like Dr. Who 1962 yeah. look. Yeah. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't overcome that. Um, uh, but I appreciated it. I appreciated it, the ideas of it more yeah. than getting into it myself so i never really got into it um but uh, uh but i appreciate it curtis like as a as a producer and a creator of, of this kind of stuff because certainly you know now we're surrounded by genre things right everything everywhere genre, it seems but at, at that point in time if you were a fan of horror or science fiction um things like that uh these these things were oases you know to to come up like you you went after anything in the hopes that it was good um, yeah. and, and rang your bell in, in a way but, because many things. But back not. in that era, though, there wasn't as much. So like you said, you're hoping. No, it's good. that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. like it was an oasis. Like, you know, here, here's 50 yeah. police movies, you know, 40, you know, melodramas, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of sitcoms. If something said science fiction or horror, it was the total exception. And you would, as a fan of that, genre of things would jump on it no matter what almost and watch it and slog through it and convince yourself it was maybe good you convince yourself it was good but you'd, you'd slog through it and then you would decide afterwards was it one of these 70s movies that i just i've never seen and i know so many people love it gargoyles i just gargoyles no. was had some had some I, again i remember it as having some good things if i went back and watched it i remember it being kind of mean in a good way 
there was some yeah. meanness to it. Um, but uh, have you watched it recently? No. No. Okay. No. So, so it's been um, over. It's been God probably like 10, 15 years since I watched it. Okay. So, but did you like it then, or it wasn't one of those ones that rang your bell? I haven't revisited it, but I, 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 I could be talked into it. It's one of those things where, like, it was on Sven Gulli like two months ago, but it was a Saturday night where I, I wasn't going to be home. And wow. I was like, well, yeah, another time. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I, I, uh, I remember, but, but that was another thing. Like you would, it was, it was a movie like that would have been few and far between and you would watch it because that was something you were into. And, and, and that was, I think they were depending on that they were going to get some of that audience, but that audience wasn't recognized the way it is today. I mean, the fact you can go into, into probably CVS and get a Cthulhu plushy doll, <laughs> you, you, you know, says everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, when Cthulhu is commercialized, it's sort of like, exactly. it's not scary anymore. Exactly. You know, What's the next be, big but... scary thing? I heard there's a Danish show that's on Netflix now. God. Oh, there's so many things there, you know, and, and it's, some of it's, that's gems. going down the rabbit hole big time. But there, supposedly there's this Danish show that like will scare the crap out of you. What's it about? I have no clue. <laughs> oh, I think okay. no. now that it is. It's something about a meteor shower that strikes. And 15 years later, there's a museum on top of the site where the meteors crashed and the mm -hmm. caretaker or something of that, the, the position that this woman is in she begins to see all the weirdness that came that came down that day. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'll have to find it. I read the article and it was like, kind of, yeah. I'm like, well, give me something. Okay. Yeah. Give me something different. That sounds different. You know, it sounds like it might, uh, might be worth a look, but one of those things that's got six episodes. Shit, yeah. I wish I knew the name off the top of my head. And it's uh, funny. I just talked about it less than a day ago. Danish Netflix uh, museum, right? What, what, what do the Google, you know, tell us? Uh, Google oh, it, bro. Um, oh, you know, my wife just started watching this, actually. The really? Chosen. The, Chosen. the Chosen. I knew it was like a the. Yeah. She, she literally just started watching that. Um, uh, she, she unfortunately broke her toe yesterday, so she's kind of laid up. And um, She broke her leg? Yeah. No, her toe. Um, oh, so, oh, God, and, uh, I'm sorry. But... Uh, and she just started watching it and uh, uh she was just telling me um you know how good it is so um sounds like we've got uh you know got a reason to uh, to check it out i heard nothing but awe, awe, nothing but praise for it yeah so yeah and sometimes you find that stuff um i'll tell you the one thing you know in, in kind of an inclusion to norlis i love norlis i thought it was fun would love to have seen more and the, really, there's really nothing, not much else to say about it. But I'll tell you what I was watching a couple of weeks ago, and it was one of those I decided to dive in, just go for it. I started watching Hugh Beaumont detective movies from the 40s. Oh, I was really? Like, oh, yeah, and I could not help but love it. Just that. Now, did those have narration? No, oh, did the, they okay, did not. There was, was no narration. Say. None of the, none of the Sam Spade motifs, you know, right. Dashiell Hammer, none of that. But it was just sort of the, the. Right. It was made by a studio named PRC. And they were very low budget. You can tell just mm -hmm. by looking at it. Filmed a couple of days, maybe like a week on a on a back lot somewhere, and right. only in like five different rooms. And you know the characters kind of walk into frame like this, have their dialogue, and then kind of <laughs> right, right. Very the cameras the camera's been locked down here. We can't move it. So yeah. you know everyone so when they want to focus on something that's going down the stairs, like it literally does the like. Right. A big right. change, and it's just it you can almost like hear the, the eight hundred pound camera that can't actually move. Right? Incredible, incredible stuff. Yeah, you That's know, uh, I'm glad we got a chance to talk again. I know we're going to part ways momentarily. The uh, Sunday night dinner calls, but I'd it love does. to talk to you again. Uh, coming up, we're, we are. I know, you know, bad for your health. I was talking to a friend of mine who would love to do cold check, dive right into the fiftieth anniversary of Night Stalker. Is that coming up? Really? That's, that's it. Actually, crazy. just passed recently. Uh huh. Uh huh. And and I was like, oh, I'd love to do this, but I just, you know, the only people I had a feeling would have seen it were you and this my my friends from North Carolina, and they spoke in awe. They're like, oh my god, we remember the night it aired. And I was like, eh, it's a little before my time, but I could I could probably yeah. sw swindle away around it. <laughs> I don't think I, you know, see, I don't remember. 
I remember being seeing the 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 series when it began because that was I don't think I saw the movies until later, like yeah. the Night Stalker, the Night Strangler movies. But that's a perfect example of what we we're talking about in terms of genre productions that would draw you in because the fact there was a show being advertised on ABC for the whatever it was the fall season you know as television shows used to come out you know new stuff in the fall that was about a supernatural uh a reporter investigating the supernatural um you, you know sign me up right yeah. but that because that was one show among 50 others and that was probably the only show that, that dealt had... with the supernatural exactly so you, you know and and turned out you know to have a lot of I mean, there are issues, you know, because there were of, issues with the Night Stalker chose to but do it. There no, was but by fun. and large, I mean, I can I can watch even the awful ones and sort of and and Darren McGavin's performance and the writing and the narration there, which is almost invariably, again, snarky, wry. If it's describing something, it's got punch to it. Uh, it's it's the counter to Norlis in a way, and it's yeah. and if you're going to use narration. It's probably a good. Learning. It's funny with Kolchak's with Kolchak's narration, you'd get um, uh, Joe Frazier, one time former heavyweight contender, now heavyweight drunk, who took his last punch. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, it's you know, uh, uh, you know, Jenny Carlson, you know, swing shift operator at the Lucky You Casino, you know, about on her on her way to her last shift right you know you know they were kind of predictable her last shift. right but 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 you know there there was there was a there was a rhythm to them and they yeah. delivered on that rhythm not just simply saying it was another hot night in vegas where people come to gamble the stars were out figuratively yeah. and speaking you know not even that much just the stars were out <laughs> <laughs> did you have a favorite episode of night stalker man um, anyone that stuck to your mind because there were a couple that stuck because i didn't get into my exposure to night stalker and I, I would love to do i would love to sit down and with you and and talk night stalker you know the uh-huh. yonas Korzani and that vampire with uh barry atwater and all that i'd love to talk that with you one of these days the, um, um the one that really i mean i i did enjoy a lot of them uh the one that really sticks out a lot in my mind and it was a kind of a weird um I want to say uh, Indian mythology thing. It was this thing called the Raksasha. And it was like this, um, this, uh, I don't know, kind of like bog monster or something like that. I think there was one that was actually about a bog monster, but this was a kind of an Indian demon. The Spanish moss monster? No, that was a different one. That was was, a different one. That was the Spanish moss monster. (laughs) This one was, I want to say the monster was called the Raksasha. And, and it, and it had this weird, um, twist in it because initially he sort of finds some swastikas uh at the scene of the of the murders and he thinks there's some kind of like nazi connection and then wasn't he, it, he, was, was it a very dark episode now that i'm thinking about it like just nighttime and you could only see like the blue from his suit maybe but the, the <sighs> creature would appear to you as people you trusted and and that was the twist you know in it but then the the swastika thing was it wasn't the Nazi swastika. It was the the reverse swastika, which was the original Indian symbol before yeah. it was corrupted by the Nazis. That that was a kind of a protection against dark forces. That one's always stuck out to me. But um, uh, but I you know there's there's a I probably enjoyed even the ones that are just utter trash. You know the like the, the last I, I like I remember when I got the DVD set and it was one of those my exposure to Night Stalker came through Christmas Story because like you know. Darren McGavin yeah, just yeah, chews yeah, up yeah, the yeah. scenes in that right, and right, getting right. into movies and all that stuff. Right. I remember asking guy? like, right. what else has he been in? Yeah. Yeah. And my father told me Mike Hammer, the old Mike Hammer show from the 1950s. Yeah. So yeah. naturally I went looking for it. And then back in the day, you know, he did a, a, a show in the sixties and I'm like, Oh, this guy's pretty reliable. And then it was all of a sudden. Oh, right absolutely. Start. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he was, he was, he was a, um, you know, uh, just a per- terrific performer that would elevate anything he was in. So, and uh, very underrated in by dawn's early light. I always thought Darren McGavin as that conflicted politician who then ends up becoming like the. I don't know if you've ever seen by dawn's early light. That that um, 
it's a it's it was a made for TV movie in 1990 starring Powers Powers Booth, Rebecca De Mornay, oh shit, Martin Landau, Darren McGavin, Rip Torn. Sounds familiar. That was creepy guy from um... Ghostbusters Two, the Johnny, yeah. the yeah. <laughs> Was it one it's, of those, uh, like, uh, what was it about? Was it like one of those, like, semi-apocalypse type movies? It was a or? semi-apocalyptic movie where the Russians and the Americans, we all nuke each other. and Okay. And there's a, there's a breach in the chain of command, and Martin Landau's the president. Okay. And it, all I can picture Martin Landau is, is Bela Lugosi. <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> no, I would yeah. recommend it. McGavin plays the Secretary of State, and they find him in Baton Rouge or New Orleans. It was Louisiana. I remember that clear as day. And okay. they're okay. like, well, sorry, sir. It's not hail to the chief. And just that dryness, just kind of like, ah, you know, let's get it out of the way. Is the war. Have we won the war? And they're like, sir, we're, you're here to help stop the war. <laughs> just this, just to, McGavin, man. McGavin was yeah. awesome. Yeah. You ever see? Well, you've seen the Natural, right? The movie of course, Robert the Richard, Natural you know, is a great I mean, movie. He's amazing in that. You know, the little bit part he has in that. You know, he's just. I love him. Guy. He. I remember. God damn, when was it? I had to have been in grade school. Flick, flicking through the channels. Sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> flicking through the channels, and I came across him on like Larry King, and he was talking about the Natural, mm-hmm. and he was talking just real and it was the first time i ever heard him speak real and it really seemed like there was no difference between his screen persona and his his uh his... real life persona yeah maybe i mean I, I think his it was the focus on the performance right you know that was yeah the... natural is great natural is a great little movie We've left Norlis in the dust. We're on the Norlis is in the dust. It, it's it's not getting picked up. There will be no Norlis tape two. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've covered everything we could on the Norlis tapes. I guess uh, so. I'd cool. love to get you back soon to talk some other random quasi movie from the week. If if you any tickles your fancy. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's exchange some notes and we'll find. I'm sure we can find something. There's something we can find. Anything you want exactly. to plug coming up, DG? You know, you've got, I know I've noticed you've got a few, you've did the Chichester chats. I, I noticed that. I kind of chuckled at that. <laughs> yeah. Those, uh, those guys are good uh, podcasters. They decided to uh, brand uh, <laughs> some monthly uh, uh, sort of, um, I guess, uh, random, random set of, of my work, you know, that they want to talk about. So uh, more power to them if they want to do that. Um I would just I love uh, your you know, work. Just... I I love your work. I could talk your all your Daredevil stories all day, but honestly, I love talking. Yeah, this, this is fun. This it's is fun. fun. I love the randomness. <laughs> so let's find another one, and we'll we'll dive down that rabbit hole next time out. Sounds like a plan. Uh, right, I Tom. did have one question about your work, oh, though. Going back no, to please. it, and I forgot to pop this to you earlier. Yeah, the proposed Daredevil time travel story. Right. Mm-hmm. Was he going to be wearing the red suit or the newer the suit you? the 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 enhanced nothing, suit nothing the the gag we were going to do was um uh and by gag i just mean like the conceit not, not that it was meant to be funny we were going to like steal a page from a uh you know terminator type travel and so he was going to he was going to end up in old new york naked and have to construct a suit uh for uh for the time period you know so it would be something that would be more 1800s flavored in one form or another, uh, that gotcha. would, uh, that would evoke, uh, some aspect, you know, probably more of the classic suit, but with some kind of, uh, 1890s, uh, uh, flair. Uh, gotcha. that was, that was the thing we never got to any point of, um, production, of production design or, or yeah, yeah. thinking about that beyond, but that was, that was definitely the, the angle. You know, and that was going to be Paul. Uh, uh, Paul Ryan was going to be the artist on that, which would have been been terrific. Yeah, it would have been. Well, thank you for answering that. But I, I remember yeah. we had touched upon it in one of our previous episodes because I went back and watched one of them, just because I was bored and I didn't want to be vain. And it was just it was I. I there was a reason I just can't remember why. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that was that would have been, been a fun story. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, sometimes you. Uh, it just don't add up, and then you move on to the No, rest. they don't. I'm sorry about that. Well, DG, as always, it's a pleasure talking to you, man. I love talking Same to you. Here, I'd man. love to get you back. 
All right, we'll, we'll figure something out and we'll we'll schedule that next time out. And don't forget to check out Still Dead Illustrations. I got to stand up once again to show this. This is the official Bad for Your Health Entertainment t-shirt designed by Still Dead Illustrations with a lovely back logo designed by the lovely Chelsea Langelier. If anybody wants one, don't forget to message me on Bad for Your Health Entertainment or my personal page if we're friends. If not, Bad for Your Health. And uh, check out Still Dead Illustrations and Still Dead Art. For Mr. D.D. Chichester, I'm Tom, and we'll see you this Wednesday with an up with a new episode of Bad Fear Health Entertainment. Have a good night, everyone. Take, Stay safe take and care, talk to Tom. you soon. Be well. You too, buddy.